Hey everyone, this is Ben from Puka J Productions. I've got a new video for you today. I have been digging through our archives. This is something that I had always meant to get released. Um, this is the full interview that we did with Brian Forrester in I think December 2015. Sat down and Brian was very kind to spend an afternoon with us wandering around in Cusco. I've traveled with Brian for several weeks through Peru and Bolivia in the past. Uh, he's a great guy, he's very generous with his time and his knowledge. Uh, we thank him a lot for that. We've been in touch with Brian uh, in the intervening couple of years and we've talked about having him back on our podcast soon, which we hope to do. Uh, but in the meantime, please enjoy the video and remember to like and subscribe. Cheers. Good. Sure. Okay, so just talk to us a little bit about how you got involved in all this ancient sites and interesting stuff, just a little background. Well, I've been interested in ancient enigmas since I was a little kid, and I think all little kids are interested, <clears throat> except I didn't grow out of it, whereas most kids do. And, you know, the Sphinx, of course, was a fascination. Um, indigenous cultures have always been a fascination because growing up in Canada, my own family and, you know, the European history is very dull. But when you meet indigenous people who have been there, well, Europeans have been there for 150 years and indigenous people have been there for 10,000 years plus. So they know <laughs> what, you know, what the world is that you're living in. And so that's always been something that I've, I've done. I, I took up carving, which became a profession. Um, I actually didn't bother continuing on with university because I preferred to do that. And my also a very major interest in Polynesia, because how did these people get from Tahiti to, how did they find these islands? So I lived in Hawaii to learn how that was, you know, how wayfinding was done. Um, and by the, I basically covered all of Polynesia, and when I got to uh, Raiatea, which is the, the, the center, the heart, then all of a sudden that interest turned off, more or less. So I thought, uh, I woke up one morning and this little voice in my head said, Peru four times and I went oh I've never been oh there's Machu Picchu in Peru so when I came here the first time um, I hired a guide who tried to explain to me how all of these megalithic works were done and I just said no you know you're you're talking nonsense you know you're, a Bronze Age culture is able to shape granite and basalt something's going on here and then the more that I spent time here I, I knew that there had to have been an older culture that had lost ancient high technology, similar to Egypt. Um, and so I just, I follow my heart and this is where my heart is. And Peru and South America, Mesoamerica America is in general fascinating structures and buildings here. Before we get into that though, I just want to ask you quickly about Gebekli Tepe and uh -huh. how you think or what you feel about Gebekli Tepe and, and what ramifications it has and, and whether it makes us reconsider where we are in terms of archeology span the history of humans? Well, we've had it nailed into our heads that real civilization began 6,000 years ago in the Indus Valley and Mesopotamia and stuff. And Gobekli Tepe is finally the most obvious example um, of a sophisticated site that was built 12,000 plus years ago. It was supposedly buried 12,000 years ago. And so that shows that um, people were quite sophisticated at that time. They had to be able to coordinate each other to be able to find the stone, move it, set it up, um, you know, line, line the stones up to the different um, celestial and, and lunar alignments and stuff like that. So it's technically, it's not very impressive looking as compared to here, right. but the fact that it has been dated uh, being at least 12,000 years ago opens the door for um, academics having to look at sites in Peru, uh, Bolivia, Egypt, and some other parts of the world as being at least the same age, if not older. Right. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, dating techniques and like some of the problems uh, involved with uh, you know, carbon dating and uh, stuff like that? How do we date stone? How do we, how do we figure out? How old this stuff really is. Okay, well, carbon-14 is what everyone knows about, and that only applies to organic materials, which leaves stone out of the picture. But there's a new uh, test called cosmogenic testing, and that measures the amount of solar radiation which is penetrated up to one meter into stone. 
Um, and it's basically the reverse of carbon-14 because carbon-14 is where um, the level of carbon-14 as it deteriorates <coughs> gives you an estimate of age, but uh, cosmogenic is where it's the buildup. And it actually transforms some of the minerals inside the stone. So with that technology, um, you're able to know how long the stone has been on the surface exposed to, to, to the sun. Wow, so have, have we been able to do any of that testing, or is anybody doing that down here? Well, we've attempted to. Some samples from Pumapunku were sent to Purdue University in the United States, and they, they said they would test it, and then the supervisor of the laboratory found out where the stone came from, and he said, you're not testing that material. So this is something you run into a lot, isn't it? With uh... Well, yeah, and then the second time, it was sent to a, a laboratory in France, and they said, yes, we'll, we'll date this. We didn't tell them where it was from, I don't think. And um, they, the results, when they came back to the lab, they contacted us and they said, <coughs> we're sending your money back because the, the age of, this, of the stone surfaces cannot be older than what archaeologists accept the age of Pumapunku is, which tells us that it's older. Right. Uh, and so I'm going to blackmail that laboratory pretty soon. Um, and then it was sent to another laboratory, and again, they said, no, we're not going to test this material. So the problem that we have is people actually believe, like a Walt Disney film, that, um, that science is this open pursuit of, of knowledge. But when you find out that it's actually a little boy and girls club where they protect each other, uh, that's why it's important for you, <laughs> you guys, and me and others to... Um, to expose the fact that we have been lied to about our history, and it's our birthright to know. Yeah, that's pretty much the thing we're, we're trying to get to. Right. Yeah. yeah. So now, Puma Punku seems to be primarily andesite, but there's this red uh, sandstone there mm -hmm. as well. But what I've noticed that a lot of these other sites, uh, there's a large amount of shaped andesite blocks that aren't actually used in any construction, they're just kind of sitting around. Is, have you noticed the same thing, or is there something that they were using andesite for at some of these other sites? I mean, I've been seeing it almost everywhere. There's there's andesite just sitting around. Oh, what, you mean the piles? Yeah, they, well, there's, there's definitely piles, or they've been put into, like, walls or something yeah. where they obviously weren't initially. Well, this is, this is a prime example of that. That's recycling by the Inca. The Inca used exclusively andesite because this whole area is andesite um, because they're you know the Inca's role was to build buildings um, out of what was available so they recycled some of the damaged structures from uh, the early megalithic builders what's intriguing about the Inca is that they appear to have been incredibly respectful of whoever it was that first built Cusco they would they seemingly would never touch any of the of the surfaces and remove something but if something was on the ground it's like well we don't know where that goes so let's use it to build something around it or to enhance what's already been here Oyente Tambo, Machu Picchu, Saxe Waman being very classic examples of that but the megalithic builders would go as far as was required which is, is a, a similar thing we find in Egypt um, they had to have stone that either had a high crystal, uh, quartz crystal content or iron content. So the basalt, um, which is what this is, possibly, comes from a, one quarry 50 kilometers in that direction. And um, then there's the limestone, which sucks at Waman, which is right here. And its quarry is about 10 to 15 kilometers in that direction. Um, and there are other quarries too, uh, of great distance. And the, the important thing for the megalithic builders was any structure could only be constructed out of stone from one quarry. They, they never mixed the stone. It all had to be the same quality because of the characteristics that they were after, which is almost science fiction. Some form of residence or... Right. Yeah, most people won't accept the idea, but it, it seems that they were building resonant structures. That's why the quartz was important. The interior, in general, what they built were courtyards. So the energy inside the courtyard was different from the outside. And it's possible that they wanted this difference in um, 
acoustic and other frequencies inside the structure because they felt comfortable there, whereas outside they weren't comfortable with the natural um, vibrations. We were shown in Egypt a lot of the constructions there, sort of there's the, the, the red or rose granite on the outside and then the, the limestone on the inside that then is protected by another layer of granite on the inside and, and over the top. Right. And that limestone seems to be very much eaten away even though it's been protected by the, the granite on the outside. So uh -huh. it seems like there was something going on there. Well, yeah, and of course that's where the Great Pyramid is intriguing because if it was an energetic structure, the limestone acts as an insulator, whereas the granite um, is uh, piezoelectric. And, and supposedly that was the function of the capstone material on the exterior. It came from a different quarry. You know, the, the pyramids were built from the site itself. And there was no, this idea about it being concrete is complete bullshit. You know, that's been proven. We found fossil remnants in the stone. Yeah, well, exactly. And, you know, ask any engineer, would you, would you build this out of concrete? They would say, well, yeah, I could, but what I would do is I would have one form and I would produce 2.3 million blocks using this form. I would not use 2.3 million forms to build this thing. That's just stupid. And that's why we all, you know, we love having engineers and, and practical people with us, uh, stonemasons, etc., because they'll look at this stuff and go, wow, you know, that's very difficult. Whereas the layperson, if they're fed the information, oh, it was done like this, it's like, okay, you know. Right. Unfortunately, 95% of the people who come here just to, will absorb anything that somebody tells them without thinking. So what did the Incas themselves say about, uh, about the, the different types of construction? Because in you know, sort of orthodox archaeology, they'll tell you the Incas built everything. But did the Incas say something else? Is, did they have their own legends and beliefs? Yes, they did. Almost every tour guide here will say that the, the fine work is called Imperial Inca because the Inca family, um, who were the Inca, the general population were not the Inca, they were native people, but the royal family of the Inca, who were about uh, 1,000 people maybe, um, it was a very tight bloodline, um, you know, the story is that they would say, well, I want the nicest palace, but that's corrupted information because that comes from Europe. All of, all of the chronicles that the Spanish wrote are corrupted stories because they were racist and they were stupid. They were basically mercenaries. And they were zealots too. Well, and, and, and they were Catholic zealots as well. And, and anyone who's a zealot of any religion means that they're insecure. So that's what they say. The, you know, the Inca, who is the, <clears throat> the Inca king, and he was not a king, of the Inca empire, and it was not an empire decided that, you know, I want the nicest palace made, and that's not true. Their story is, um, most of it is lost because the Spanish destroy, tried to destroy as much of their knowledge as possible. But luckily, there are bits and pieces still remaining. And, and when the Spanish first saw Sacsayhuaman, they were blown away because nothing like that exists of that quality in Europe. And they said, did you build this? And they just laughed and said, no, this was here when we got here. And that tells you that Inca, or that Cusco is a much older city. Absolutely. Uh, can you walk us through or talk to us a little bit about the, the different styles in the, the stonework that we see out here? Because it, it really is unlike anything. Some, there's some similarities like the Valley Temple, the Sphinx, some of the stones that go around corners and such like that. But the, the different types and the quality of stonework here is just, I mean, it's pretty much unique. See stuff like this anywhere else? Can you yeah. talk to us a little bit about the different styles? Yeah, I, I would say there are two basic styles with variation, and the style that was used depended upon the function of the um, of what they were building. So the polygonal is the most famous that you see at Saxo Oman, Oyente Tambo, the Inca Roca wall, green wall down here, and then you have an almost but not completely linear rectangular construction, um, which is what you find at the Cori Cancha, and which also I will show, show you up here. Um, and the type of stone, again, depended upon uh, the function. Um, andesite was not used very much by the megalithic builders for some reason, an important reason. It was mainly the granite, 
or granodiorite and basalt that they were again going to whatever length was required to uh, to access it. Yeah, and, and you're right. The Valley Temple is about as similar as you can get to, to here. But what we find in Egypt is um, here we have organic construction, and in Egypt we more have a Western European kind of linear construction. You notice like beautiful straight lines. You don't find any straight lines here, except Pumapunku and Tiwanaku, which don't match anything on the planet. That's what makes it so weird. There's, uh, there's the other thing I've noticed here that's, that's you get a lot more of is that is the, the living rock, like the carving into at Kenko. And right. Has, do, do you think that's a, a different style, or is that? I mean, this is Jesus Kamara. You know, they talk about that's yeah. an older style that then is maybe revered by that later style that then the Inca discovered both uh -huh. later on. Do you, do you find any distinction between those or you kind of consider it's the same? Well, the level of erosion is incredible. It's much more than on the other surfaces. So it could very well be that there was a first civilization that was simply cutting surfaces for something like all these so-called thrones of which there are thousands of. Um, and then you have the more, you know, and it's quite crude work. Um, and then you have the much more refined megalithic stuff, and then you have the Inca after that. So I, I think Jesus is still correct that there are probably three um, ages, um, but the most, ref uh, the most refined stuff seems to be the, the second culture. Cellular. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, actually, a cellular culture is a great way to, and it's very right, you know, they're very right-brained approach that these people or whatever they were were doing, and that's why, it's hard to nail into somebody's head who is. Of European background because we're more left-brained but um, I think indigenous people are more you know could catch the organic aspect more but um, that's the that's what's difficult to to get people to understand um, is that some of this work we can't do to this very day it's beyond us and 99.9% .9 of, of people will not accept that because we're the highest level of evolution yeah, it's, a, it's an arrogant kind of terrible. Thought, isn't it? It's terrible. Yeah. So it sort of struck me these sort of thrones that you were talking about. That it looked more to me like this was actually like quarrying. Like they were cutting things out of the stone to take somewhere else to build something out of, rather than to make a place to sit down. It just kind of seemed like an awful lot of work to make a place to sit down. Is that something that you would agree with, or did you have an idea mm. on what they were doing? Well, the problem with the quarry approach is that they were taking really stupid shapes out. You know, quite often it would be like a pie shape would come out. Right. Uh, quarrying is normally done horizontally, where you're going layer after layer, or, or vertically, to cut somewhat uniform pieces out. And we don't find, you know, we don't find regular removal of stone in this area. It's just, again, that's why I'll probably pursue this forever because there's so many unanswerable or unanswered questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, um, how does mainstream archaeology account for you know these techniques that were used, like the cellular technique and the, the fact that there's no um, uh, mortar? or cement used between anything and they're still they don't need repair a lot of the Inca stuff is constantly being repaired but this other stuff doesn't really seem to require any maintenance or repair right uh, what, how do they how do they account for that well most of them um, either ignore the question or they say that the Inca were able to do this work with bronze hammers and meteorite iron tools but when you ask them can you show me a one minute video of you or somebody actually doing that? That shuts them up right. because um, it's not an archeological question. It's a, a question for engineers. Right. And the problem that we have is too many archeologists try to answer questions that they don't know nothing about. Right. They don't know engineering. Um, we also encountered the same thing with the elongated skulls. Every single elongated skull on the planet is the result of head binding or cranial deformation. And it's, it is not an archaeological question. It is a medical question. When, when doctors look at these things, they just don't understand what the hell they are. Talk to us a little bit between um, the effects of cranial binding and some you know, tribal traditions here and the actual skulls that you're finding 
and uh, you know the cranial, you know, the difference in the cranial capacity and stuff like that. Because mm -hmm. it seems to me like you're finding a lot of skulls that can't be explained by. Well, techniques. yeah, I would say about four percent is is the case. Um, you can change the shape of a baby's skull up to about three years old because it's quite soft. soft. Um, so you can, it's malleable and you can alter, alter the design by binding, but you can't increase the volume. So in about 4% of the cases, we find that the volume is 25 to 30% larger than normal. Um, and the Waikiki skeleton, if you get a chance to see, you'll see that Waikiki's head was the size of its torso. And that's not the result of a disease, that's, gen that's genetics. So now you've been working on getting DNA results or DNA testing on some of the skulls. Mm -hmm. how, how far along are you? What have you, what have you encountered in this experience? It's the same problem as with the stone testing. Um, uh, any laboratory that we've approached won't touch them. They won't touch the, the material because they think it will jeopardize um, their professional status. So it's been a four-year battle, but we're still working away at it. What does that say about science? It says that science is not what we think it is. It's not this open pursuit of knowledge for the betterment of humanity. Number one is how do I pay my mortgage? How do I send my kids to school? So, Don't rock no. So I, I quit science. I, I worked for the Canadian government after graduating for six months, and then I quit because I was appalled at how unprofessional. Um, it is, and ever since then, I've, I've just seen case after case of, um, of people, scientists protecting and archaeologists protecting each other, um, in order to not have their theories blown. But we have to rewrite history. It's the way it goes. That's the pursuit of humanity, advancement, not protecting and hiding behind a door. How do you uh, so how do you feel that, that that kind of mission is going? I mean, it's it's been interesting in the last few years for me. I mean, personally, on that sort of a journey just for a few years now, and there's seeing guys like your work, and there's more research. I mean, Graham stuff, obviously, with yeah. Comet and Randall Carlson. So, do you think there's? I mean, are we at a tipping point? Do you think this? I mean, you encounter must encounter so many people who come here or with you to travel, and just do you feel like people are waking up? Are they ready for this kind of a a message? I mean, that's or is it is it. Is the evidence starting to swing in our favor? I mean, what are your thoughts there? No, oh, it's, a, it's a landslide now. Standard academia have lost it. They might as well all retire right now. <laughs> because I don't, you know, they can protect their jobs if they want to or whatever. But because we have technology which is affordable that we're using here, because we have the internet, it's too late. They, they can't, people can't cover stuff up anymore. You know, I have a friend, Ellie Marzulli, who is actively pursuing... Uh, the existence of red-haired giants in North America, and we're talking seven to eight feet tall people who are not Native American people. And as soon as he, he's doing this top secretly, but he knows locations of graves of these individuals, and as soon as he is able to, and, and also he has the backing of Native American people, because they know that these so-called giants are not them, but the U.S. government has no, um, ability to access Native American locations. They own those sites. So if the Native people say, dig, then he gets to dig. As soon as he digs, satellite transmission of photographs goes instantaneously from that grave, planet-wide. And that blows the whole, that blows academia, Good, you know, bye, or stay in your office and do whatever you want. But you, we don't have to go in front of you to be peer-reviewed anymore because this information belongs to seven billion people on this planet, not you. Right. Yeah, I can't ignore it. Anymore, right? No, they can. Well, they they can, but it, it doesn't. They don't matter anymore. You know, you don't have to go up to a PhD and say, "Am I allowed to do this?" It's like you have your world, and we have the real world here that we're dealing with. You've, you've traveled fairly extensively. You've been to a lot of uh, ancient sites all over the world. There seem to be as many differences as there are similarities. But what is what strikes you the most? If, as far as differences or similarities when you go to these sites? Um, well, the basic thing is that if you're able to access the oral tradition of, of people, they tell you a different story than what academics tell you. Because in general, academics do not ask Native people about their own history. They decide that they're going to make, they're going to ex excavate and make up a story, which is very offensive to Native people. 
So when you, when you talk to Native people, almost always they will say, there were people here before us because we found this when we got here. And that's, um, that's the basic story is that human history is far older and more interesting than what we've been taught. And that's what fascinates me because it makes it more interesting. Um, and again, a case in point being Easter Island, um, if you meet the right people there, they will tell you that there, were, there was a race that existed before them that did some of the work. And their bloodline, that ancient bloodline, is in these people. It's, you know, no one in general <clears throat> arrives at a place and wipes every single you know, person out. They mix. So that gives the Rapa Nui or Easter Island people possibly a 12,000 year history rather than a 2,000 year history of, you know, rather than simply, well, we came from Tahiti and we found this and then we decided to live here. It's like, we came from Tahiti and we found these people here and we mixed with them. And uh, so our history is more profound than we thought it was. Well, we, we tend to believe that, uh, I mean, science is now starting to talk about how we humanoids in our current form interbred with Neanderthals and other forms of humanoids in the in the distant past and we tend to think of Neanderthals and Cro-Magnon sort of humanoids as you know bashing kind of stones into the ground and uh, not really communicating but it's quite possible that these people were builders and able to you know have a far more uh, advanced uh, civilization than right now we credit them with or do you think it's I think it's someone else. I think that's what we're discovering is um, there are many, many more types of, um, of humanoid living here than what we're, we've been taught. Um, and some of them were far more advanced than we were. I honestly think the elongated skull people of Paracas are, are a separate bloodline, but they were exterminated by the Nazca people. And that's what you tend to find as well is um, people of, of a very or bloodlines of a very high intellectual, spiritual nature don't have a tendency to be warlike. The stupid ones, like Homo sapiens sapiens, are the nasty ones. And they, or us, um, have probably been responsible for wiping all sorts of different people out. Or wiping them out and, and intermixing with them. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's why when, you know, when some people get their DNA test, you know, tested, they'll get 50% this, 20% that, 1% unknown. You know, there could be some ancestor that is from one of these, you know, major... Yeah, we're still trying to figure out this rhesus negative bloodline or something where that came in. Or... Well, and junk, D yeah, what's junk DNA? What's junk DNA? It's junk, yeah. Well, it's amazing. Nature produces junk. Yeah, it's amazing that they would just assume that all this material it must be junk. Because we, be... we don't know what it does. Yeah, if you don't know what it is... Uh, it doesn't mean it's <laughs> it's like here. well, it's over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, is there a specific site here that really stands out to you, or you feel is the most significant or important? They're all amazing. Uh, the most important place is the Cori Cancha, because that was and is uh, the spiritual center of the Inca people, and it was here before the Inca existed. I strongly believe that when Manco Capac, who was the leader of the Inca first entered Cusco from that direction. They found the Cori Cancha and they just went, what is this? And they, it still ha, it, uh, has an energetic nature. And back then it would have had more so because there was uh, water running underground underneath the Cori Cancha, ener you know, energizing it. So I think even the high Inca said, I can't use this as my palace because it's too profound. Where we're filming right now <coughs> is where he built his palace. This, yeah. You seem to, to find that a lot under really ancient, important structures, aquifers, water, right. underneath. That seems to be a, a common theme. Do you have an idea of what was going on there? Uh, yeah, in Egypt and here, um, water was underground water was utilized, or, <clears throat> or the sites were built um, on top of underground moving water because that helped to energize the stone that created um, a, a subtle energy in the structure itself. Yeah. Especially Egypt, because uh, the Giza Plateau is a system of tunnels right. that used to have water running through it. Right. Yeah. We were at um, Abu Sir, Abu Ghraib, and under Abu Sir there's a 
you know, this, and it would have been probably about a foot underneath the, the, the old level of the floor, and now it's exposed, but there's this, you know, sort of a half pipe running underneath that, and they, you know, they try to tell you it's like a sewage line, and yet it runs all the way down and in this sort of bowl at the bottom where it would be collected, and it just seemed to me like it was either like a filtration system or like you're talking about like some sort of energy, way to energize the water or something like that. And it right. It just seems amazing that everything is a sewer line or... A, uh -huh. It doesn't really make any. It doesn't really make any sense. But. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to actually hear that you, you were saying in Starbucks earlier the story about about Rina Kapak coming in and saying this place. Oh no, I don't want that, and I'm going to please fix this up. This other megalithic ruined place, and how they they used up those sites. Right. Uh, yeah, I'd love to if you could I mean, tell us that little story again that you, you mentioned. Uh, now? Yeah. If you okay. Like, sure. okay. Or we can do it when we walk. I mean, no, no, it's no, it's good. Um, I, th I think, and actually, I'm doing this ancient alien style. I, I don't look into the camera. They love they love it like that. <laughs> don't look at the camera. Oh, so you look wherever you want, bro. Okay, <laughs> really good evidence that Cusco existed before was the fact that the Inca a thousand years ago were kicked out of Lake Titicaca by the Aymara people, and so rather than dispersing, they went. They knew that they would. Um, find a place to resettle and they followed a road that existed north and um, when they got to within one hour's drive of Cusco there is a big wall with a gate in it that's called the Intipunku and that is megalithic when they found that I think that's when they decided rather than follow the Inca trail into the sacred valley because they were following the sacred river from Lake Titicaca this way by normal nature, they would have followed the river down into the Sacred Valley, but instead they encountered this gate, and I'm sure they said, what's beyond the gate? And uh, as they followed the gate, they encountered megalithic structures. By the time they reached Cusco itself, they found an abandoned city that was megalithic. And so blown away by this fact that I'm sure they said, maybe, this was the city of the gods. This is where we're going to build our new capital. And so the Cori Cancha existed at that time. And because of its energetic nature uh, I and profound construction, I believe that Manco Capac simply said, this is too profound for me to live in. I get first choice of all of the other megalithic structures. And so he looked up on the hill which is exactly where we are, and he found uh, what is called San Cristobel, or San Cristobal, and he said, rebuild this megalithic ruin and make it my palace. And the policy of the Inca was that each of the 12 Inca in succession had what was called a panaca, and that means they chose who did what, like who was in charge of the military, who was in charge of the, the priesthood, etc., etc., and it had to be a member of the family. but. When that High Inca died, the son who inherited the title of High Inca got to choose his own government and people, which is a very smart move. So what you had was the son of Manco Capac could not live where we are in, in Manco Capac's palace, so he had to uh, find another place to live. And so he would have one of the other megalithic courtyards rebuilt. By the time you get to the eighth High Inca, there were no more megalithic uh, ruins to be restored. So that's where we find that the 9th, the 10th, the 11th all had to build their structures from scratch. And what we see there is they're all made of little blocks or adobe. No megalithic work. So if the Inca were responsible for the megalithic work, it meant they have had profound capability in the beginning and slid downhill for the next 500 years, which is not the case. They simply found an abandoned megalithic city and rebuilt it. So let's talk about the tools that the Inca were using. They were Bronze Age, as you, you mentioned before. So we've got some incredible sites here with incredibly massive shaped stones. Mm -hmm. How do you do that with bronze tools? You, you can't. So do you have any theories, any ideas about how you would move some of these stones in, in ancient times? The only thing you, the only way you could do that is to be able to make the stone light. And that means 
Again, these people or beings had the capability of using vibrational technologies be beyond Star Trek, probably. And they were able to match the, vib the vibrational characteristics of basalt and, uh, and granite and granodiorite somehow to be able to either levitate the stone or make it so light that it was like styrofoam. And they were able to manipulate matter um, basically capable of turning super hard stone into the consistency of toffee temporarily. And I think that's how they did the polygonal construction because every stone is a different shape and size and any stonemason will tell you that's insane, you don't do that. You know, if you're building a building, you, you do, if, if you have the capability of, uh, of creating a product, you make each one uniform. That way you know how long the wall is and how many stones you need. But if you do it where every stone's a different shape and size, that compounds the difficulty a hundred or a thousand fold. You, you wouldn't be able to just sort of uh, cut one stone and then cut the next. You would need to have sort of an overall plan or an idea ahead of time to how all these things fit. It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle, so you can't just kind of cut shapes out of cardboard and put them together and hope to get a, a good jigsaw puzzle out of it. You need some sort of a... We'd use computers and lasers and kind of stuff if we needed to do something like that today. It's Right. How could they possibly... Some of the, the stones too, I know the really massive ones, they've been lifted up and placed on a on a base that's been like cut to shape the the stone that it's put on. It just Yeah. It's, it's they like actually th well they're actually three dimensionally locked together. Um, there are no straight lines. Everything it, again is or, is organic, which is not something that we can easily comprehend. What is your personal belief like the, the boss knobs and the, the indentations? There's a lot of you know, archaeologists like to say, oh, this is what they used to, to move these stones around. They were able to put rope or a lever underneath them or something. And how do you feel about that? It's completely stupid. <clears throat> because some of the biggest stones don't have knobs. And they're not on the bottom. And then when you ask the archaeologist, well, why doesn't that stone have a knob? They will literally say the Inca cut that one off and didn't get around to finishing the other ones. Right. Now, you have this profound construction where you can't fit a human hair in between, and they don't cut the knobs off? Again, nobody knows what those knobs were for. Um, you have to not step out of the box. You have to jump off a cliff off the box to even try to grasp what was going on. It's possible that they literally were solar energy absorbers or, or energy absorbers or something but I, I walk past these things every day and I still don't you know it still pisses me off that I can't figure this stuff out but that's what keeps me in Cusco you know if I can't find out if I can't figure it figure it out there has to be somebody on the planet that can do this and thanks to the internet may, maybe somebody will look at the picture and go oh I know that because we find them in Egypt we find them in all the megalithic sites have have knobs. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing too. It feels like Peru very similar to Egypt in that most of it's probably still under the ground and, under, and, and not discovered. This isn't like a, a static thing that we know about, right? There, there are still people making fresh discoveries. You told us that story of you know they're doing street work in Cusco and uncovering a staircase. Yeah. So I mean, do, do you I mean? That's yeah. What percentage do you think is left yeah. un, unexcavated? A lot more in Egypt than here. I mean, the, whoever was building Egypt, or the stuff in Egypt, almost all of it's underground. The only stuff on the surface are the pyramids. But this tunnel network is, goes for miles. But here, uh, Teo Paredes, who's a, a PhD anthropologist, um, his family, his European side of the family's been here for 300 years, his native family's been here for God knows how long. But he said most of Cusco is underground to this very day. Yeah, and he was, you know, he was born here. And he, the great thing about uh, Teo was that uh, when he was growing up um, in, a, in a wealthy family, all of, his, all of the people who worked in his house were Quechua-speaking people. So they taught him the oral traditions of the Inca and, and earlier people. And so his, his uh, knowledge is profound. So there was some stuff you wanted to show us here? Uh, yeah. You want to do that? Yeah. Is that only out of battery? Yeah. No, so let's switch a battery. battery. So this is the original, probably, construction uh, Inca 
that Manco Capac had done. He was the first of the High Inca. So it's about a thousand years old. But what you'll notice is the lintels or the tops of each one of those niches is linear. And it's actually a different material. So what automatically we can say, and it's basalt, so we can say automatically that the Inca found an abandoned site here that was megalithic in nature and it was made out of basalt. And the basalt is from a quarry 50 kilometers that way. Whereas all the andesite, which is the Inca construction, is local stone. And what I'm going to show you next is what remains of the original um, megalithic work, which I'm sure uh, caused Manco Capac to say, build my palace here because the ancient ones were here and also I get to see Cusco, which is right below us. Cool. Okay. And if you guys want to stand there, I'll take pictures to put on Facebook. Thanks, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so this is something you've discovered recently. Well, we saw it about two years ago, <clears throat> but it was behind barbed wire fence and a bunch of, of mad dogs were in there. And since we moved here, all of a sudden, all the fence is gone. So you can see that socks one man right there. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. All right. So originally, socks one man went from the top all the way down to the city. And that's why we find bits and pieces of it. Dogs. <coughs> hey puppy. I think that dog used to be in here. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> That's good. But this is where, this is where you'll see. Like this is transition. <coughs> oh well, forget that. But there, see right there. Yeah, yeah. This is obvious. Right. Underneath, this is basalt, again, from a quarry 50 kilometers away. Right. On top of it is Inca construction. Right. Because the Spanish knew what concrete was. As soon as they came here, they found sources of, of materials to make concrete. And so they would have used concrete. But the Inca, in this case, uh, this may not have been super significant to the Inca. That's why they didn't do nice, tight work. But you have the difference. Andesite, local, basalt, from a great distance. Strange depressions, and sometimes protrusions. Here's, one of the, here's a classic knob type thing. You can see it could, you could lash, or put a rope under here to help lift it. The problem is, it's not in the center. So since it's not in the center, it would go that way. Yeah. So it had to, and this one here, another one. Yeah. And that's the sort of, I mean, that's just everywhere now. You can just, uh, that block, Cusco, what's down. Yeah. And this is, looks like, I mean, is this Inca wall? Is this yeah. an Inca wall? This is Inca. Because yeah. these blocks here have been repurposed, right? Yeah, well... Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh yeah. There's, oh, yeah. The, there's the Cory Cancha. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think... Well, nice. Else? Got there. And... I guess. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Ildi. Colonial Spanish with concrete. And then megalithic. Wow, 
is amazing, isn't it? Yeah, you know, see. So this this effect here on these two stoves. Yeah. What's going on there? Is that just age, or are we talking about some kind of vitrification? Or we're talking the possibility that this is catastrophic damage. It's not damage from stones being on top of it, but our theory is that in Egypt and here, and in a few parts of other parts of the world, that there was um, the civilization that did this work did so more than 12,000 years ago. The way we date that is the fact that there was a, a, a global catastrophe that happened approximately 12,000 years ago. It came from space. It could have been uh, plasma ejection from the sun, according to Robert Schock, or it could have been um, em the emission of lethal energy from uh, the center of our galaxy, which Paul de La Violette believes, who's a physicist, uh, he believes that the center of, of our galaxy is not a black hole, but is a pulsar. So every, approximately every half processional cycle, which is 13,000 years, more or less, it emits energy, which is lethal, which moves across the galactic plane, creating things like um, disturbing small planets, um, catching comets and altering their course. So it could be that a comet did this. Um, and so there was, uh, especially at high altitude as well, like here, uh, that this disturbance was so profound that this could be the damage from that 12,000 year old um, catastrophic event, which would have wiped out whoever was here. And obviously, um, Puma Punku was hit pretty hard by yeah. something. Yeah, exactly. And the latest theory about that is that actually the, the volcano where the gray um, andesite comes from, that its last eruption may have been about the same time. It might have been triggered by the, by the cataclysmic event because that was when the ice age ended. And um, according to Robert Schock, the melting that happened of the poles that caused the water of the oceans to rise by 300 plus feet could have taken place in less than two weeks because it wouldn't have been the melting of the poles. It would have been the vaporization um, of ice going into the atmosphere, supersaturating it, and then it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, or whatever you want to say, causing the rising of sea level. Um, and that could also have uh, resulted in our planet going from being vertical to 23 and a half degrees because Uranus is rotating like this. And the universe wasn't, you know, wasn't set up catastrophically or you know, like in a weird way like that. Something obviously happened. So yeah. that's, I think that's what we're looking at. And there's lots of evidence of this in Egypt. Yes. And Machu Picchu, there was a, you know, <coughs> there, well, something pulled those stones apart. That's the only damage I've, like structural damage I've really significant that I've seen to any of these that still standing, like in more or less in one piece. That's the only piece that seems like it's, you know, really damaged radically shifted. yeah I mean, right so much of this stuff is still perfect yeah, yeah. well it, it was built so well that it is it, you know it is it's earthquake proof but it's not catastrophic earthquake proof right. and so that would have been a one-time event and again <clears throat> the inca likely found this the way it is and uh didn't touch it but they would have used the stone that had fallen down and recycled it to rebuild um what was uh, Manco Capac's palace. That, we, we see that at Sasquatch as well, right? When they may rebuild the walls and backfill them with some of the actual shaped blocks. Like the, exactly, you know, yeah. exactly. And, you know, it's, it's obvious in many of the streets of Cusco. You'll see a complete um, andesite wall with this rectangular block of basalt stuck into it. And that isn't because it's artistic or because it's for strength, it's because it was lying on the ground and why not use it? And we'll see more. This is all Michael Calpex's palace. Oh, wow. I think this is half of a frog. This is Inca, yeah. or this is Inca reusing the basalt. And you see, if this is the quality of Inca craftsmanship, that's 
much, much better. If this was all by, done by the same masons, this would be far more refined. Um, but it's not, because this, is, this was shaped using probably meteorite iron. I guess this is one of the greatest similarities between South America and Egypt, is that the early stuff is the oldest stuff, is the best stuff, has the best work going on, right. except the harder stone. Yeah, and the same in Turkey and Italy. Uh, the Parthenon in Greece is built on top of a megalithic structure. Those were the go that was done by the gods. The Titans were not a story. The Titans were people, but the Titans got wiped out. And then came their descendants, the Greeks, who stole all their information from the Egyptians. And the Egypt all the in Egyptian information comes from people before, too. Yeah, the Comitians or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Yeah, like Malta, same thing. Right? Oh, Malta, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, there's... Beautiful spot. And then Sesquai Waman right up there, yeah? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, the, yeah, the terrace thing you can see originally went all the way to the top. Beautiful spot. That's a hell of a wall, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it just it seems really obvious that the temple of Wirakosha or even it's the, the, the way that the, the Inca tried to recreate the windows and that shape yeah. with their stone. Yeah. Something about that sort of trapezoid shape. Yeah, sure. right. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. It's acoustic. It's acoustic, yes. You've already been to Oyente Tambo and you st stuck your head in the yep. yes. toned yes. A flat. You can hear from one end to the other end. Yes. They, they had the Tiwanaku, they had this, the stones with the sort of larger hole at one end and the smaller hole at the other end, and if you stand on one end and you talk through it, it's just kind of broadcast your voice. Yeah, but that's the, that's the Tiwanaku culture did that stuff. Right. They, the, T, the Tiwanaku people arrived 2,000 years ago and found Megalithic the stuff. abandoned site. <laughs> Tiwanaku and Pumapunku are the same place, it's just they've got different fences and names, right, right. and they did the same thing. They found all this catastrophic damage and so they went well let's rebuild this thing you know for our our purpose right. um, and then they got kicked out and then the Aymara people you know they to this day exist but if you ask the local people <coughs> in the Aymaras in general the history of uh, Tiwanaka this thing like, and if they say that they they did the work that their ancestors did it's, it's not true right. unless the Aymara and the Tiwanaku people Mixed, which is possible. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I'm good. Man. Yeah, I'm good. Good. Right. Yeah. Is there anything else you want? Um, yeah. I just want to have a look around. <laughs> <laughs> While we're up here, we haven't been chased out. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing we're alive here. I guess this is the hotel. Someone, someone's yard. It's a hotel. Yeah. It only has six rooms. This is really great, Brian. Yeah, good. Thanks a lot. Yeah. 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 Yeah.